Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering chapter 16 from our Campbell's 12th edition biology textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. All right, chapter 16, looking at molecular basis of inheritance. Of course, we're talking about the DNA. We're talking about genes. And I just want to do a quick refresher here so that you remember what a gene looks like. It's made up of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And remember that the building blocks of DNA are called nucleotides. Uh, here, this dashed line you see represents a nucleotide. Remember that every nucleotide has a 5' prime phosphate group. It's called the 5' prime phosphate because the phosphate is attached to the fifth carbon of this sugar right here. This sugar is called a pentose sugar because it has five carbons, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, the phosphate group is attached to the fifth carbon. Okay, and then in DNA, remember that this pentose carbon is called deoxyribose because of its hydrogen right here on the two prime carbon. If this was RNA, remember it would have a hydroxyl group connected to this two prime carbon. Additionally, there's a third part to this. There's the nitrogenous base. Remember that there are four nitrogenous bases for DNA. This one happens to be adenine, a purine. Uh, purines have two rings. Above it, you have the single ring cytosine, which is a pyrimidine. Then you have guanine, which is a purine, and thymine, which is a pyrimidine. So these are the four different nitrogenous bases, A's, G's, C's, and T's. And remember that DNA, um, these nucleotides link together uh, you see how this phosphate group is linked to the next nucleotide by binding to its three prime carbon of the deoxyribose sugar. This is, this is how nucleotides link together. Remember those bonds were called phosphodiester bonds. And this forms a strand. This is a DNA strand. So this would be a strand of DNA four nucleotides long. And at one end, I want you to see this, is very important for this chapter. At one end, it's called the five prime end of the DNA strand. Every DNA strand and every RNA strand has a five prime end. And on that five prime end, you have a phosphate group. This is called the five prime end, or sometimes they call this the five prime phosphate. So you can always find a free-hanging phosphate group at the five prime end. Conversely, let's look at the other end down here. Go all the way down here. This is known as the three prime end. The three prime end, because at the three prime end, you have a hydroxyl group at the three prime end. And again, they're referring to the three prime carbon of the pentose sugar. That three prime carbon has a hydroxyl group. And that's how nucleotides link together. Remember, the five prime phosphate of one nucleotide gets bound to the three prime carbon on the next nucleotide. And because that's how they link together, you're always going to have a five prime end with a free, free phosphate group and a three prime end with the three hydroxyl group. This is known as the sugar phosphate backbone, right? You see how it's shaded in blue here? This is known as the backbone of DNA. You have sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. That's the sugar phosphate backbone. And sticking out to the right, you can see the nitrogenous bases, A, C, G, T, and this is known as a strand of DNA. And just a fun fact for you, in case you just are curious, it took me a long, long time to understand why they call DNA an acid. And do you want to know why? Well, it's because of this net negative charge of DNA. 
You see how all these phosphate groups have a negative charge associated with them? See all these phosphates have a negative charge associated with them? Well, because DNA has a net negative charge and acids tend to have net negative charges in solution because of the fact that they donate protons to those solutions, DNA is considered an acid. Isn't that neat? All right, now again, this is a strand of DNA, one strand of DNA, um, but is DNA usually single-stranded or double-stranded? Right, Wicket, right as always. DNA is usually double-stranded. So what you have are two of these strands, and they come together such that the nitrogenous bases pair up. Do you guys recall from a previous chapter how the nitrogenous bases pair up? It's the A's, adenines, which pair up with the T's or thymines, and they pair up with two hydrogen bonds. You can see the two hydrogen bonds that form between these two nitrogenous bases. And remember, in RNA, the only difference would be that A's pair up with U's, uracil. And in both DNA and RNA, G's, guanine, pairs up with C, cytosine, and it's with three hydrogen bonds. So make sure you understand the difference. Two hydrogen bonds for A's and T's, three hydrogen bonds for G's and C's, and this is how the two strands of DNA are held together. The two strands of DNA are held together with weak hydrogen bonds between those nitrogenous bases. Also, I want you to remember that the two strands of DNA, when you have double-stranded DNA like this, the two strands of DNA are called complementary strands of DNA. They complement each other. And that the two strands always point in opposite directions. Do you guys remember that? For example, the strand on the left if this is its five prime end with a phosphate group, and this being the three prime end with a hydroxyl group, its complementary strand is always headed the opposite direction. Do you recall? The three prime end would be up here, and its five prime phosphate would be down here. What was the term for this? Do you guys remember the term for these two strands pointing in opposite directions? Can you beat Wicket? Exactly right, Wicket. Hopefully you beat Wicket. Anti-parallel, right? Do you guys recall that term, anti-parallel? The two strands of DNA are always pointing anti-parallel to one another, and that's very vital for understanding this chapter because this chapter is about DNA replication. That's what I'm going to focus on. How does the DNA replicate? Do you guys remember that during mitosis, you know, before... Before you can do mitosis, you had to copy the DNA. Do you guys remember that? During S phase of interphase, we needed to replicate the chromosomes. We needed to copy all 46 chromosomes so that we end up with 92 chromosomes so that then we can do mitosis and separate the DNA and, and form two daughter cells, right? So during S phase... How does the DNA replicate? How does the DNA copy itself? This is what we're talking about in this chapter. So in case you're wondering, what is this chapter all about? Mainly, this chapter is about DNA replication. What's happening in S phase of interphase? How are we getting sister chromatids formed? Okay, and to understand that, you need to understand that DNA is double-stranded. DNA has the two strands going anti-parallel to one another. You need to understand that A's pair with T's, G's pair with C's. All of this is vital to understanding this chapter. So what is the general idea behind how DNA is replicated? Well, first of all, you should know that again, the two strands of DNA are complementary. Remember A's pair with T's, G's pair with C's on the other strand. Each strand then can act as a template to build a new strand during the replication. So this is kind of what happens. Look at this, you guys. 
Do you agree, again, you see how there's a strand of DNA on the left and a strand of DNA on the right right here? Do you agree that you could unzip this DNA? Do, the reason you can unzip DNA so easily is because are these, are these two strands held together with strong covalent bonds or weak hydrogen bonds? That's right, Wicket. Weak hydrogen bonds. Can't you break hydrogen bonds pretty easily? Remember, there's two hydrogen bonds between these A's and these T's. There's three hydrogen bonds between these C's and these G's. So there are special enzymes that can just unzip the DNA, you know, like a zipper, right? And bring the two strands apart. And if you bring the two strands apart, can't you use each strand as kind of a template to build a new strand, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, during DNA replication, the two strands of DNA are unzipped just like a zipper, and then each strand is read by special enzymes, and those enzymes make a new daughter strand. So there, you know, one, you know, they'll read the A and put a T, they'll read the C and put a G, you see, so you could make a daughter strand here, you see? You can make a daughter strand here. This is a newly synthesized strand of DNA. And you can read the other template strand and make a daughter strand over here, a newly synthesized strand of DNA over here. And this method of copying the DNA this way, having a template with a daughter, a template with a daughter, is called the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. You started with a double-stranded DNA parent molecule or template. You unzipped it. You unzipped it, and each, each side of the zipper, each strand served as a template to form a new complementary daughter strand. Does that make sense? So hopefully that makes sense. This is how DNA is replicated. First, you have to unzip it. Then you use each of the two strands as a template to build an all new, what's called daughter strand of DNA. And that daughter is complementary to the template. And that will allow you to copy your DNA exactly. During DNA replication, the speed and accuracy is remarkable, and more than a dozen enzymes and other proteins participate in this process. Replication in bacteria is best understood, but evidence suggests that the replication process in eukaryotes and prokaryotes is fundamentally similar. We're going to be focusing on how DNA replication works in prokaryotes. Um, but yes, keep in mind that it's very similar in eukaryotes as well. Now, during DNA replication, replication begins at particular sites called origins of replication, where the two strands of DNA are separated or unzipped opening up what's known as the replication bubble. I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Now, what's interesting is that a eukaryotic chromosome may have several hundreds or thousands of origins of replication. While if you remember from a previous chapter, prokaryotes, they only have one origin of replication. That's a key difference I need you to remember. All right, so on the left, you see origin of replication in an E. coli cell. Remember, E. coli is a type of prokaryote, a bacteria. And remember, just like most prokaryotes or bacteria, it has a single circularized double-stranded DNA. That's what this represents right here. And remember, there is only one origin of replication. So at this particular site, the DNA will unzip, it'll separate. Uh, the dark blue represents the template strand and the light blue, these are the daughters, the new daughter strands of complementary DNA. And notice how this replication can continue in both directions. You see, so you unzip the DNA, a replication fork, this is known as a replication fork because it looks like a fork in a road. Uh, DNA is copied in the right direction and here is the fork, the, D, the replication fork, and DNA replication occurs in the left direction, and here is another replication fork. So every, and look how this looks like a bubble. This is known as the replication bubble. So again, 
In prokaryotes, you have double-stranded DNA in a closed circle, a circularized double-strand DNA. At this one particular site, the origin of replication, the DNA is separated or unzipped, and DNA replication proceeds in both directions from that, from that origin of replication. And this is known as a replication fork. So there are two replication forks which proceed in opposite directions from the origin of replication. They copy, copy, copy. You see, they copy, copy, copy until you get to the termination site, which would be somewhere around here. And there you go. You have your two copies of that circularized DNA. Isn't that cool? And do you see why it's called semi-conservative replication? Because you have a... You have an old template strand in blue here with a newly synthesized daughter strand in gray here. And you have another old template here with a newly synthesized daughter strand here. You see how it works? Isn't that neat? So this is known as two daughter DNA molecules. Now juxtapose that, compare that with a eukaryotic cell. Remember, eukaryotes have linear chromosomes and they have way more DNA, right? Do you remember how much more DNA a eukaryote has? So for instance, humans have roughly uh, 3.5 billion nucleotides to copy, whereas uh, E. coli only has about 6 million nucleotides to copy. We just have way more copying to do. If we started copying with one origin of replication, if we started copying at one spot, it would take forever to copy our DNA, much longer than it should. So instead of one origin of replication, uh, take a look here. Instead of one origin of replication, we have several origin of replication. And this would just be in a zoomed in region of a chromosome. A real chromosome would have hundreds or thousands of these origins. And notice that at each of these origin of replication, you unzip the DNA and each time you unzip the DNA, that forms a replication bubble, right? One of these uh, bubbles. And then the DNA is copied in both directions. And so here's a fork here's a fork. Each bubble has a fork proceeding in both directions. And when, when do you know you've copied everything? Well, when these bubbles touch, right? When these forks reach each other, you have copied the two strands of DNA. And again, remember, you will end up with semi-conservative uh, DNA replication, a template strand in dark blue and a daughter strand in gray. Template strand in dark blue, daughter strand in gray. Isn't that neat? All right, now that we have the big picture idea of what's happening during DNA replication, let's go into some finer details like how is this daughter strand made? How do we how exactly do we make this daughter strand of DNA using the template? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, you should know that if this is the template, see on the the, the right strand here, which I'm showing you, if this is the template strand, we want to copy the template. We're going to make a complementary copy of the template on the left. And complementary means if the template has a T, the complement will put an A. If the, if the template has a G, the daughter strand will put a C. If the template has a C, the daughter strand will put a G. And look what's next. Look what's next. We want to copy an A. What should we complement an A with? That's right, a T, right? So look how we build. This is the daughter strand on the left. And notice that we are building the daughter strand in a particular direction. This is so important. I need you to see this. You can only build this daughter in this particular direction. Look what we're doing. We're building from the five prime. You see this? We are building from the five prime towards which end? Towards the three prime. You see that? The daughter strand, the new strand, the daughter strand is synthesized from five prime towards what? Towards three prime. And that's why I wrote down here, you see what's highlighted at the bottom left? DNA is synthesized 
in a five prime to three prime direction. But remember, that's with re respect to the daughter strand. The daughter strand itself is being built five to three. We're not talking about the template. On the template, you're going three to five, okay? Remember, that's because the two are anti-parallel to one another, so don't get confused. You are building the daughter strand of DNA from five prime to three prime. That means that you can only add new nucleotides onto the three prime end of the daughter strand of DNA, okay? So you see, if you wanna place, if you wanna complement an A on the template, you're gonna have to put a T on the daughter strand and you have to put the T connecting to the three prime end of this new, newly synthesized strand. And by the way, in case you're wondering what in the world this is, this is not just a nucleotide. Remember a nucleotide has a phosphate group, a pentose sugar and a nitrogenous base. This is known as a nucleotide triphosphate. So it's actually a nucleotide with three phosphates. You kind of need these triphosphates because guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna use the power, you're gonna use the energy that's released when you cleave both of these phosphates off. You're gonna cleave both of these phosphates off, you know, cut them, hydrolyze them. And that's where you get your energy required to link this phosphate onto the you know, three prime carbon on this daughter strand of DNA. So you see what happens? Look, when you link the T, the T thymine onto this daughter strand, you end up losing these two phosphates. You lose those two phosphates. And you have now linked this thymine onto the growing daughter strand of DNA with a phosphodiester bond. And now what would you do? What would be the next step? Can you beat Wicket? Right, wicket. Exactly. Now we want to complement the C. We're still building in a five prime to three prime direction. Now we want to complement C. What's the complement to C? Can you beat wicket? <laughs> right, that's right again. Um, yes, it's, it's a G, right? So we would put a GTP, a guanine triphosphate, again, cleaving two phosphates off and building a G here. So do you see what I'm talking about? We're building the daughter strand of DNA from five prime to three prime with respect to the daughter strand. We're complementing the template strand with uh, nucleotide triphosphates, which we cleave in order to build our daughter strand. And here's something else I need you to know. What, what is doing this? How is this being built? It's a special enzyme that does this daughter strand synthesis. And that special enzyme is called DNA polymerase. You see this right here? DNA polymerase. And in bacteria, it's known as DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 copies the template strand and puts down the daughter strand. And in what direction does the DNA polymerase 3 work? Which direction? That's right, like it five prime to three prime direction always. You cannot add new nucleotides to the five prime end of the daughter strand. You have to add new nucleotides to the three prime end of the daughter strand during DNA replication. Oh, but there's a catch. <laughs> All right, so there's a catch to this. This is probably the hardest part of this chapter to understand, so I need you to pay attention for a second and try to absorb what I'm telling you because if you understand this little bit, it'll make the rest of the chapter oh so much easier. And I know you can get it. It just, it's not tricky. It's just you have to understand this one thing. And that is that, look at this. The enzyme, the enzyme that copies DNA in a five prime to three prime direction is called DNA polymerase three. And it does a good job. Look what it's doing. It's copying DNA and making the complementary daughter strand, right? But what if I told you DNA polymerase 3 has a problem, okay? I need you to understand DNA polymerase 3's problem. And its problem is that if there's a template strand, you see this template strand? If there's a template strand and no, no daughter strand already started, if there is no, if there's nothing to build off of, then DNA polymerase 3 cannot start the new strand of DNA. So you might be wondering, well, how in the world do we copy our DNA then? 
you know, if we have to copy a template into a daughter strand, well, how would we ever do that if there's nothing on the, if there's no daughter strand? Well, that's, that's what we have to address right here. So take a look. This is a strand of DNA we want to copy. See in green right here? This is a strand of DNA we need to copy. Now, can we start a new strand of DNA with DNA polymerase 3? Can we start the daughter strand and just start copying? So do you think this red thing is DNA polymerase 3? <laughs> right, Wicket, that can't be. Because DNA polymerase 3 can't start the new daughter strand. It can only build off of a pre-existing daughter strand. So we need a friend to help out. You see this red one right here? You see this red enzyme? This is not your DNA polymerase 3 friend because your DNA polymerase 3 friend can't start a new strand of DNA. Instead, this red enzyme represents RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase. And what, what in the world is RNA polymerase doing? Uh, okay, so we want to copy the template strand. RNA polymerase is more than capable and happy to start a new strand, a complementary strand. So it's copying the DNA template into an RNA complement. So what does that mean? That means that if this nucleotide right here is an A, it would put what here as a complement for A if it's building a strand of RNA. So the yellow would be a strand of RNA. What would this be? If this is A, this would be, that's right again, Wicket, always right, Wicket. That is a U, a uracil. Does that make sense? So if this is a, a T on the DNA, that would be an A. If this is a G, that's a C. However, if this is an A, that's a U, right? So look what you're doing. Again, we want to copy the strand of DNA, but our friend DNA polymerase 3 can't start a fresh strand, so our friend RNA polymerase instead starts a new strand of RNA. So in yellow, this is a strand of RNA, but RNA polymerase doesn't have to copy all the DNA into RNA, it just has to start, start a new strand. So it, it only copies, you know, a, just over a dozen nucleotides. It doesn't copy that much. It just copies a few nucleotides and then it leaves. It's more than ha happy to leave, right? At that point, do we have something to build off of? Yes. And so now your friend DNA polymerase 3, this blue one, can attach and take over copying the rest to DNA. And this our, this piece of RNA has a name. I need you to know this little piece of RNA has a name. And here you can see that little piece of RNA in yellow on the, uh, on the left here. That's also, that's called a primer. That's called a primer, okay? So RNA polymerase starts a new strand with putting down an RNA primer. And then that primes it, right? So RNA polymerase can detach allowing DNA polymerase 3 to attach and copy the rest in DNA. I know this is a little bit confusing, so let's head to the board and talk about it step by step and come back. All right, so here I'm gonna explain how we copy DNA. So if we have a single strand of DNA, what you need to understand is this, something needs to happen. Um, you would think DNA polymerase 3 would attach to the DNA and copy the DNA, right? Uh, but that's actually not what happens. A different enzyme called, uh, I'm gonna draw it here, a different enzyme called RNA polymerase, also known as primase, this enzyme attaches first and actually copies in a five prime to three prime direction it copies the DNA into a short stretch of RNA. Why is this? Because DNA polymerase 3 is not able to start a new strand from scratch. DNA polymerase 3 needs something to build off of. So what does RNA polymerase do? RNA polymerase attaches to the DNA and copies the DNA into RNA, a short stretch of RNA, and then the RNA polymerase goes away. All right, the RNA polymerase goes away. Next, what happens is DNA polymerase can now attach 
and take over because now DNA polymerase has something to build off of. You see, DNA polymerase has something to build off of. And remember, you are building five prime to three prime. You're always building uh, the DNA five prime to three prime. Okay, so just remember when you're, when you're dealing with copying DNA, first RNA polymerase has to put down a short stretch of RNA and this is called the primer. This short stretch of RNA is called the primer. Next, DNA polymerase three can take over and copy the rest of the DNA into DNA, right? Complementary DNA. All right, now that we know how DNA is copied, let's talk about some of the other more than dozen enzymes and proteins that play a role during DNA replication. Starting with this one here, here's a double strand DNA we want to copy. You might be wondering who's doing the unzipping of the DNA. Remember that the two strands of DNA need to be unwound and unzipped? Well, that unwinding is the job of this green enzyme here called helicase. Helicases are enzymes that untwist the double helix at the replication forks. And you can think of helicase as the ones, the enzyme that's doing the unzipping. Now, when you unzip the DNA and you have two strands of single strand DNA, those strands, they tend to want to rezip. Does that make sense? Like the, the zipper just wants to rezip immediately. So to prevent the two strands from just immediately re-annealing, you have these little gray guys. You see these little guys? These are called single strand binding proteins. They're these little proteins that bind to the single strand DNA, preventing the DNA from re-zipping or re-annealing it's called. Okay, so again, single strand binding proteins bind to and stabilize the single-stranded DNA after the helicases have unwound them. Okay, at that point, you already know what needs to happen, right? I need to copy the DNA. Can, can DNA polymerase 3 copy the DNA from scratch? No, <laughs> of course not, Wicket. Good job paying attention. No, so you remember your RNA polymerase friend, also known as primase, that's this pink enzyme here. RNA polymerase or primase will put down an RNA primer, remember, copying the DNA to RNA, and then it can leave. And who attaches next? Can you beat Wicket? That's right. DNA polymerase 3 will attach and copy the rest into DNA. Now let me ask you this. Let's let's pay attention to this really closely. You see on this strand here, do you see this strand here on the top? We were able to put down a primer building in this direction. See the black arrow here pointing towards the replication fork. We were able to build the daughter strand towards the replication fork, correct? Let me ask you this, based on what you know uh, so far about DNA replication, it needs to be done in a five prime to three prime direction, like this, this little primer is being put down, five prime to three prime towards the fork. But could we do the same thing on the other strand? If I wanna copy the other strand down here, could I do the same thing? Could RNA polymerase put down a primer building towards the fork? You see, if we started a daughter strand here on the bottom, could we build towards the fork? No, we can't, right? Because if we did, we'd actually be building the daughter strand three to five, three prime to five prime. Can we build RNA or DNA, can we build 3 prime to 5 prime? No, unfortunately, neither DNA nor RNA can be built in a 3 prime to 5 prime direction, right? So again, can we build towards the fork on this strand? No. Can we build towards the fork on that strand? Yes. So that means that we need to copy the DNA in a different direction on the bottom strand. So the strand, look at this, the strand where we can build towards the fork is called the leading strand. 
And the strand where we must build away from the fork is called the lagging strand. Let me take you to the board and show you how we build the leading strand and the lagging strand and some of the terminology that's involved and some of the enzymes that are involved with it as well. All right, so how is DNA copied, double-stranded DNA? Let's take a look. So here we have double-stranded DNA, right? You've got your double-stranded DNA. These are the nucleotide pairings. And you want to copy the DNA. Remember, double-stranded DNA is copied in a semi-conservative fashion. So what we need to do is separate the two strands of DNA from one another. Okay, so imagine an enzyme is going to come through, cut those hydrogen bonds, separating the two strands from one another. Okay, what you're going to get is something like this. Okay, that's the three prime end of this strand and this strand that's the five prime end of the other strand remember dna is anti-parallel that's why this end is the three prime end of this strand that's the five prime end of the other strand okay so we need to copy this dna right so let's talk about how we're going to copy the bottom strand first remember you have to synthesize dna in a five prime to three prime direction right uh, with respect to the new strand of dna so we need to copy which way? Are we going to copy this way or are we going to make copy this way? 5 prime to 3 prime. Actually, it would be this way, right? We'd need to go in this direction for 5 prime to 3 prime because the new daughter strand is going to be anti-parallel to this bottom strand. So, can DNA polymerase attach and start copying the DNA into complementary DNA? No. Remember what we just talked about before this? RNA polymerase, remember RNA polymerase must attach first. It then copies a short stretch of the DNA into RNA and then leaves, right? The RNA polymerase goes away, leaving behind a short stretch of RNA. Red is RNA. And this short stretch of RNA was built 5 prime to 3 prime. And that short stretch is called the primer, the primer. Okay. But now that the RNA polymerase is gone and, and it's left behind the little short primer. Now DNA polymerase is able to attach. Okay, let me show you that. This marker is fighting me. DNA polymerase now attaches and it copies the rest of it into DNA, right? And um, it just copies towards the replication fork. Okay, now, now um, this is called, this, this bottom strand is called the leading strand. And I'll explain why in a second. It's the leading strand. What does that mean? The leading strand is the strand that is being synthesized toward the replication fork. You notice how we're going five prime to three prime towards the replication fork. The more you unzip the DNA, the more you simply copy the DNA towards the fork. So on the leading strand, you're building towards the fork in a five prime to three prime direction. And also you only need one primer. That primer's at the very beginning. Okay. So let me explain the other strand. So if I want to copy this other strand, what do I need to do? Can I, can RNA polymerase attach here and copy towards the fork? The answer is no. Uh, in the, if you paid attention, you know that you can only make DNA five prime to three prime. So that would be this direction away from the fork. Does that make sense? So RNA polymerase still needs to attach, but it attaches right near the fork and it builds the RNA away from the fork. RNA polymerase then detaches and DNA polymerase can attach and DNA polymerase now has the primer to build off of and it will build the rest of the DNA away from the fork. Okay, that's called the lagging strand. This one's called the lagging strand. Why? Because you are lagging behind. You are moving away from the replication fork. Why? Because five prime to three prime in this case is away from the fork. 
All right, so what happens when you continue? Let's say I unzip even more DNA. Let's say I unzip even more of the DNA. I'm just showing you what happens when I continue to unzip the DNA. What's happening on the leading strand? That DNA polymerase doesn't care. It just keeps continuing to copy towards the fork. What happens on the lagging strand? Ah, RNA polymerase must attach right here by the fork. Build a short stretch of RNA called the primer away from the fork. DNA polymerase 3 then attaches and copies the rest into DNA. And by the way, DNA polymerase 3 will stall out here when it touches the previous uh, primer on the previous fragment. And by the way, on the lagging strand, so every time you unzip the DNA, you got to put down a new primer and more DNA. You unzip the DNA, put down a new primer and more DNA. Okay, and you're going to leave behind these fragments, these fragments of DNA and RNA. This is a fragment, and these fragments are called Okazaki fragments. Okay. All right, so in the leading strand, you put down one primer, and then you build DNA towards the fork. The more you unzip the fork, the more you copy DNA. On the lagging strand, you, you unzip first, then put down a primer away from the fork, and then DNA away from the fork. When you unzip more, you have to put down a whole new primer with more DNA. So you're gonna end up with a bunch of these fragments of RNA DNA on the lagging strand, and those fragments are called Okazaki fragments. So I hope that helps. Uh, that's how the leading strand and the lagging strand are copied uh, during DNA replication. Now you may be wondering what happens to those short RNA primers on the lagging strand? Do you know how the lagging strand has a bunch of Okazaki fragments and each Okazaki fragment has a primer at the beginning? Well, don't we need to replace those primers with DNA because we're not trying to copy the DNA to RNA and DNA. We're trying to copy the DNA to DNA, right? So at some point, we need to come in and replace those RNA primers with DNA. Does that make sense? So take a look here. If this is an RNA primer on the lagging strand and in blue we have DNA, it's actually the job of this guy, DNA polymerase 1. He comes in and his job, this enzyme's job, is to chop out that RNA primer. So like this stretch of red here, right? What DNA polymerase 1 does is it removes the RNA primer and replaces it with what? Replaces it with DNA. You see that? And here's another enzyme we need to know about. After DNA polymerase 1 replaces that short RNA primer with DNA, he doesn't quite finish the job. Take a look at this. If we look really, really closely, notice how there's still a break in the sugar phosphate backbone of the daughter strand of DNA. That means that after DNA polymerase 1 replaced the primer with DNA, it wasn't able to actually connect the two Okazaki fragments. There is still a break in the sugar phosphate backbone, right? So to fix that break, another enzyme comes along after DNA polymerase one's finished. It comes along, it's called DNA ligase. And DNA ligase's job is to fix this break. It What it does is it connects the two Okazaki fragments to one another, it joins the two, by making a the fixing that phosphodiester bond and thereby making the daughter strand of DNA continuous and not fragmented anymore. So again, the job of DNA polymerase one is to replace RNA primers with DNA. It does a good job, but it leaves a break. So DNA ligase joins the two Okazaki fragments. And here we can see some of these major players. Remember, it primase, let's just do a quick review here. Primase, remember you need, another, another term for primase was RNA polymerase. Primase or RNA polymerase synthesizes an RNA primer 
at the five prime end of leading strand and at the five prime end of each Okazaki fragment of the lagging strand. Remember, you need primase to put down a primer so that DNA polymerase 3 can take over. DNA polymerase 3 uses the parental DNA as a template, synthesizes a new DNA strand by adding nucleotides to an RNA primer or pre-existing DNA strand. This is because DNA polymerase 3 cannot begin a new strand of DNA. Next, what happens? Remember, DNA polymerase 1, his job is to remove RNA nucleotides of primer from 5 prime end and replace them with DNA nucleotides added to 3 prime end of adjacent fragments. And then finally, DNA ligase joins the Okazaki fragments of lagging strand on leading strand joins three prime end of DNA that replaces primer to rest of leading strand DNA. So these are all uh, more technical jargon, but at least you know what these players do. And earlier we talked about the role of helicase, helicase which unwinds, or I call it unzips the DNA on the parental double helix at the replication fork. And then remember, once you unwind the DNA, the single strand binding proteins need to come along to, to keep the two strands apart, right? The single strand binding proteins bind to and stabilize single strand DNA until it is used as a template. All right, let's summarize everything we've learned here about DNA replication. Remember, the two strands of DNA need to be unzipped and this is done by an enzyme named helicase, which unwinds the two strands of DNA. Those two strands are then prevented from reannealing by binding of these uh, single strand binding proteins here. These single strand binding proteins prevent the two strands from coming back together. And then a D an RNA polymerase or primase puts down a primer on the leading strand. You see the top strand here is going to serve as the leading strand. The bottom strand here is going to serve as the lagging strand. On the leading strand, one uh, primer can be placed by RNA polymerase, also known as primase. So in red, it puts down a short RNA primer. And then RNA polymerase, aka primase, can leave allowing DNA polymerase 3 to attach and have something to build off of. It then builds towards the replication fork. Notice that we're building 5' prime towards 3' prime here. And that DNA polymerase 3 synthesizes the leading strand continuously. Remember what that means? The more helicase unwinds, the more this DNA polymerase 3 can copy. All right, but remember on the lagging strand, remember we cannot build towards the fork because we need to build the daughter strand 5 prime to 3 prime. Remember that? So again, the first thing that happens is what? We start at the fork, RNA polymerase or primase synthesizes a short RNA primer. Notice how it's putting down an RNA primer and it is building 5' prime to 3' prime with respect to the daughter strand of DNA. And then what happens? Remember, then DNA polymerase 3 can take over and copy the rest into DNA because it has that primer to build off of. And then what happens? Do you remember? Can you beat Wicket? What's the next step? That's right, Wicket. DNA polymerase 1 needs to come in and replace the RNA primer with DNA nucleotides. And then do you remember this last, last step over here? Um, because there is a, a break in the backbone on the daughter strand, DNA ligase, DNA ligase must come in to finally join the two Okazaki fragments by repairing the backbone of the DNA, okay? So only on the lagging strand do we have this activity of DNA polymerase 1 and, and ligase doing all this work. The leading strand only has one primer at the very, very beginning because the DNA can be synthesized continuously from that point on. Now, 
The last one to talk about here is called topoisomerase, and its job is to relieve overwinding strain ahead of replication forks by breaking, swiveling, and rejoining the DNA strands. That sounds very complex, but what does it do? Let's talk about that next. All right, so what does topoisomerase, sometimes known as gyrase, do? As you can see here, topoisomerase works upstream of the replication fork. If this is the replication fork with helicase unwinding the DNA, topoisomerase is well upstream. It's well up here somewhere doing its job. And its job is pretty important because without it, without it doing its job, uh, the DNA replication will stall out and helicase will be unable to unzip the DNA. And here is why. So here, let's imagine if I have a zipper, right? Like a zipper. And I attach one end of the zipper to my table and then with glue. I glue one end of the zipper to my table with glue. And then I twist the remaining zipper so it looks like a double helix of DNA. You know how the helix of DNA is a spiral shape, right? So imagine I've twisted this zipper into a spiral. Now what happens if I hold the top of the zipper and then I try to unzip the zipper? What do you think happens? The more I try to unzip towards the bottom, towards my desk, what happens to the rest of the zipper? That's right, Wicket. The rest of it gets too overwound. It gets what's called super coiled, right? So if I have a zipper that's attached to my table that's all twisted and I'm sitting here trying to unzip it, the more I try to unzip, the more the rest of it coils up and becomes what's known as super coiled DNA. And that's a problem with, uh, with helicase. Helicase is trying to unzip the DNA and as helicase unzips, the rest of the DNA gets coiled more and more and more, just like the zipper uh, analogy I just gave you. So topoisomerase, what does it do? Its job is to fix that problem. Now, let's go back to my analogy here, right? I'm trying to unzip this, this twisted up DNA, right? Or this twisted up zipper. I'm trying to unzip it, but the rest of it's get all coiled up. Imagine if I had a friend who had scissors and my friend could cut the rest of the DNA, uh, cut it, let it unwind, and then glue it back together. Would that allow me to continue to unzip, right? So what, what, effectively what my friend is doing is cutting the DNA, cutting the zipper, allowing it to relieve that torsional stress, alleviating, uh, alleviating that uh, supercoiling so that I can continue to unzip, right? Isn't that interesting? So that's what topoisomerase does. As the DNA gets more and more twisted up and supercoiled, topoisomerase literally breaks the DNA. Now, some topoisomerases can, can cut one strand of the DNA. Some cut both strands of the DNA. They let that stress relieve itself. They, leave, they let it uncoil, um, and then they glue it back together. They re-ligate the DNA. Isn't that neat? So without topoisomerase, then the more helicase does its job, the more the DNA gets super coiled, and at some point it's so coiled it can't be uh, replicated any further. Topoisomerase relieves that super coiling, allowing helicase to finish its job. So here in your textbook, the way it's stated is that topoisomerase relieves overwinding strain ahead of replication forks by breaking, you know, cutting like a scissor breaking, swiveling, then rejoining the DNA strands. I hope that makes sense. You know, again, without topoisomerase, uh, the DNA would get all twisted up as you're trying to copy it, and it would be so super coiled, you couldn't unwind it any further. Now for linear DNA, like your DNA and my DNA, you know, eukaryotic DNA is linear, right? We have a problem, we have a challenge that our cells have to overcome when DNA replication is occurring. So you can see here for linear DNA, the usual replication machinery cannot complete the five prime ends of the daughter strands of DNA. This is because there is no three prime end of a pre-existing 
polynucleotide for DNA polymerase to add on to. So let me show you what that means. Let me show you this problem that eukaryotic DNA has because of our linear double-stranded DNA. All right, take a look here. Notice that this is DNA that has been copied. On top, you see the leading strand, which was copied. And on the bottom here, you see the lagging strand, which was copied with all these Okazaki fragments. So notice here at the tip of this lagging strand, a primer was put down in red, followed by DNA in gray, okay? And let's take a look. Let's take a look at this box, like what's going on in this box, okay? So if we take a close, close look here, you'll notice that here's the template strand of the DNA, which you just copied. Here's the daughter strand on top. And here's one Okazaki fragment. Here's the other Okazaki fragment. I'm sure DNA ligase one will come in and chop, chop out this RNA primer and replace it with DNA, and then DNA ligase will come in and join the two fragments together. But take a look at this primer here. I want you to turn your attention to what's called the final primer, or the last fragment. Look at this. So what if, let me ask you this. Let's say DNA uh, polymerase one chops out this primer, right, which is its job. Look, DNA polymerase one chops out that primer. Now, what do we want to do with this gap? What do we need to do with this gap? Can you beat Wicket? <laughs> That's right, Wicket. We need to fill in this gap with DNA. But do you see the problem here? Can we fill in this blank with DNA? Can, can we, can we, is there anything to build off of? Because, okay, let me ask you this first. Can we build the DNA starting at the fragment and building towards the left? Can we fill in DNA by building off of this fragment here? <laughs> That's right, Wicket. We can't build three prime to five prime. We have to build five prime to three prime. So we need to build from left to right. But is there anything to build off of? Is there a primer to build off of? No, we just chop the primer out. Does that make sense? Do you see the problem here? We have to build towards the right, uh, so, but and we have to copy the DNA, but there's nothing to build off of, so we're kind of stuck. Do you see the problem? And if we don't fix this, if we don't fill in this blank with DNA, then the next time the DNA is replicated, you're gonna lose information and, and the ends of your DNA are gonna become shorter. Does that make sense? And we can't have that. We, we can't have the ends of the DNA becoming shorter. So if we don't take care of this problem, this is going to result in further rounds of replication with shorter and shorter daughter molecules. Do we want the ends of our chromosomes to keep getting shorter and shorter every time the DNA is replicated? No way. We do not want our chromosomes to get shorter and shorter and shorter. That's the problem with eukaryotic DNA. So we need a way to fix this problem and prevent the shortening of the ends of our linear DNA. Now, before I explain how this problem is fixed, you should know that the ends of our chromosomes have sequences, nucleotide sequences called telomeres. And you can see here, if these are mitotic chromosomes, these are chromosomes in kind of bright orange, you can see the telomeres. So you notice how there are telomeres at the ends of our chromosomes. Those are known as our telomeres. And again, those telomeres are in danger of becoming shortened every time the DNA is replicated unless we can figure out how to replace that last primer. Now, luckily for us, we have an enzyme called telomerase which prevents the shortening of our chromosomes and helps with the keeping them the same length. The, the way telomerase works is that it can fill in 
that missing gap. You see this missing gap right here? Telomerase can fill in this gap with DNA, preventing the shortening of our telomeres, of our chromosomal ends. And what's interesting is today, telomerase is being studied for its role in cancer. In cancer cells, there's usually over, uh, you know, overactivity of telomerase. Telomerase prevents the shortening of the, of the chromosomes, and in cancer cells, it allows them to divide and divide and divide, you know. So one avenue of cancer treatment involves preventing telomerase from working so much in those cancerous cells. Isn't that interesting? Conversely, studies are being done with aging. Did you know when you age, your telomeres tend to shorten, your telomerase activity drops. So as you age, there are longevity studies being conducted to determine if we can increase telomerase activity, keeping our telomeres longer so that our lives are longer. Isn't that interesting how the ends of our chromosomes may have something to do with longevity? And, and they've also been linked to cancer cells when they're overactive. So telomerase and your telomeres are a mystery and quite an interesting mystery at that. Now, let's finish off this chapter by discussing a little bit about how our chromosomes look. Uh, and we can compare chromosomes in prokaryotic cells like bacteria and archaea versus eukaryotic cells like your cells and my cells. What does our DNA look like? I think we've discussed before that your DNA is not just simple double-stranded naked DNA. Remember? that uh, your DNA uh, is wrapped around these proteins called histone proteins, as we mentioned before, and that forms a structure called chromatin, right? Do you remember that? That our chromosomes consist of chromatin, which is DNA wrapped around histone proteins. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between bacterial chromosomes and eukaryotic chromosomes. Well, in the bacterial chromosome, you have, of course, double-stranded, circularized DNA, and you only have one chromosome, right? Now, this DNA is associated with a small amount of protein, not histones. In bacteria, the DNA is not wrapped around histones, but they're like histone-like proteins. Eukaryotic chromosomes are numerous, right? Like humans have 46 chromosomes, but different animals have different numbers of chromosomes, and plants all have different numbers of chromosomes. We have linear DNA molecules, and that's associated with a large amount of protein. Remember, these are called histone proteins. In bacterium, the DNA is somewhat supercoiled and found in a region called the nucleoid, whereas in eukaryotes, remember, the DNA is linear and it's found in the nucleus. Again, in eukaryotic cells, DNA is precisely combined with proteins in a complex called chromatin. Remember, DNA plus histone proteins. Proteins called histones are responsible for the main level of DNA packing in interphase chromatin. Do you remember when we talked about the cell cycle and mitosis? I told you that DNA becomes spaghettified, and then it can condense into those mitotic chromosomes. Do you remember I told you that DNA only looks like those X structures you've grown to know and love? The DNA only actually looks like that during mitosis, but when the DNA is not in mitosis, it does not look like that at all. Remember that? So in a 10 nanometer chromatin fiber, the unfolded chromatin resembles beads on a string, with each bead being a nucleosome. What is a nucleosome? A nucleosome is composed of DNA wound almost twice around a core of eight histone proteins, two each of the four main histone types. So here you can see here that these are the histone proteins. They have a histone tail Eight of these histone proteins combine with double-stranded DNA to form these histone octamers. This is an octamer, eight histone proteins in a quaternary structure. And the DNA wraps around nearly twice. 
And this is the basis of chromatin. When I say chromatin, we're talking about DNA wrapped around these histone proteins. And a single one, a single one of these histone octamers plus DNA is called the nucleosome. A nucleosome is a single one of these balls on the ball and string model here. You see, it's like a ball and string. And each one of these units is called a nucleosome. And all of it put together makes up chromatin. Now, when I say euchromatin, euchromatin is very loosely arranged chromatin, very loosely arranged 10 nanometer fibers of, of chromatin like this. And you can see those histone tails poking out the sides. Those histone tails can actually be modified to turn genes on and off. Isn't that neat? But you'll, you'll study that in more advanced genetics and biochemistry. Again, most chromatin is loosely packed in the nucleus during interphase. Remember, during interphase, you do not see those X structures. You cannot see individual chromosomes. The DNA looks like a bowl of spaghetti. And this is known as euchromatin, euchromatin. During interphase, though, a few regions of chromatin, centromeres and telomeres, are highly condensed into heterochromatin. Heterochromatin is more condensed chromatin. Dense packing of heterochromatin makes it difficult for the cell to express genetic information coded in these regions. The more densely compacted the DNA is, the harder it is to read those genes and to express those genes. During interphase, remember I said during interphase you cannot see those individual chromosomes. During interphase, chromosomes occupy specific restricted regions in the nucleus, and the fibers of different chromosomes do not become entangled. Chromatin undergoes changes in packing during the cell cycle. As the cell prepares for mitosis, the chromatin is organized into loops and coils, eventually condensing into short, thick metaphase chromosomes, those X structures you know and love. So look at this. I want to show you something. This is a cell in interphase. And you can see, actually, this is a nucleus. This is a nucleus in interphase. And each of the different chromosomes has been colored a different fluorescent color here. So this is one chromosome. Here's another chromosome. Here's another chromosome, another chromosome. Notice how even though the DNA is euchromatin for the most part, it is a bowl of spaghetti. Um, so you cannot see the individual chromosomes. They take up distinct portions, distinct regions in the nucleus so that they don't become super entangled. Because you could imagine you've got 46 of these chromosomes floating around. You don't want them to all get tangled up, you know, uh, in, into one, of, one another. Now, at the end of interphase, remember, this DNA starts to coil and coil and coil and loop and coil. And then ultimately it results in these mitotic chromosomes that you know and love. You know, you see these little X shapes, these little mitotic chromosomes that are very distinct. So imagine like you see this, you see this diffuse purple region here that looks like a bowl of spaghetti. It will condense so much that it becomes like this chromosome right here. Isn't that neat? That's how much that spaghetti is going to condense into this. This is called a mitotic chromosome. This is called a mitotic chromosome. And you know why it's called a mitotic chromosome? Because it only looks like this during mitosis. Before mitosis, during interphase, you do not see mitotic chromosomes. The chromatin is way too loose. It's a bowl of spaghetti. So how does this process work? Let me show you this real quick. Here is your euchromatin, which is very loose chromatin during interphase. Okay, here you have some heterochromatin where it's more densely arranged. Here is... Uh, prophase. Okay, look, during prophase, the the loops of DNA, the, these, these, the, the chromatin forms loops, loops along protein scaffolding. Okay, and this forms uh, very tight, condensed uh, DNA, a tight, condensed DNA. And you can see how the DNA condenses into these loop structures called rosettes. 
And those loop structures condense and condense into fully, fully condensed DNA, which we know and love to, and, and, and we know as, you know, mitotic chromosomes, those X-shaped structures. Does that make sense? And again, those histone tails, those histones can undergo chemical modifications that result in changes in chromatin condensation. This allows for effects on gene expression. So in certain tissues, like for example, in your skin cells, you may not want, you may not want uh, insulin gene to be turned on in a skin cell, right? Your skin cells don't need to be expressing the insulin gene. That's for your pancreas, right? So the insulin gene may be turned off in your skin cells. And the way your skin cells would turn off the insulin gene is by perhaps modifying those histone proteins to condense the DNA near the insulin gene to prevent its gene expression. Conversely, in the pancreas, those histones would not be condensed. Those histones would be open and the fiber would be open, allowing you to read and express that insulin protein so that your pancreas can make insulin. Isn't that neat how all these things kind of build your understanding towards a global picture of what's happening inside the cells and inside of your body? I find it fascinating myself. So with that, that's the end of this chapter 16. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. Please let me know in the comment box below if you have any questions, and I will catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.